And that's how I found out Ginsu knives can cut through human bone. But that's a different story. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm Alistair. Eight feet to my left is the amazing Marguerite. Hello, everybody. I'm who... with you in the chat tonight and on the headsets. For some reason, we still haven't figured out how to get the multi-camera to work again, and I haven't had the four hours to spare to get under the hood and make it work. So, But she I... has had the time to gussy up the stream so very, very lovely. Well, I have my priorities, don't I? I mean, we have a new story we're starting tonight, so it was time for a little bit of a spiffy up around. Streamline, spiff up. All she, those, all those kinds of we'll things. We'll see how many words we can invent that say "neat new visual effects." Yes, a, emulsify. No, emul no, no, no cooking words to talk no. about the stream. This no. is not a cooking stream, anyway. and you may not suspend fluids in fats on my computer. Just need to move some mayonnaise out of here, folks. I'll be right back. <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, for those of you who are new. Welcome. Uh, normally what happens with the show is we do three things. The first is an opening monologue, which we'll get to in a second. The second is a story. We've done a lot of interviews recently. This is, we're back to our first piece of long form fiction in a while and I'm really excited about it. And we'll also check in with what's new with us. And then we'll do some shenanigans, which will be the Magnus Archivist related fan crack you will come to know and love. <laughs> because it's usually <coughs> Magnus related fan crack. Speaking stuff. of, Thank you for that. I'm, I'm sure that'll be made a clip in a background and all sorts of fun Any stuff. minute now. Exactly. Folks, could you do me a favor and let me know how our various sound volumes are going? Um, you can hear me right now. Alistair, would you sing a sea shanty? or No, don't sing a sea shanty. Oh, God. He turned up on the Brits, by the way. What do you mean? Nathan Evans, the Scottish sea sh shanty singing viral TikTok sensation, uh, performed live at the Brit Music Awards last night. Good for him. Yes. Fair. Okay. Sounds like, looks like the volume's doing just fine, which is good. This is, like we said, a new setup. So we just want to make sure everything is coming across clear and everything sure seems to be. Hey, Catherine. <coughs> One more note real quick. As you can tell, Alistair is still recovering from this cough. <coughs> I was ill again. So apologies in advance for the for the coughing and the fact that it'll be at a loud volume on occasion. I'm afraid there's not much we can do about it at this point. But if it presents as an issue, just let us know. Hello, Contrived Pod Live. Welcome. Yes, All indeed. in wine. I'm terribly confused. Specky! Hey Raiders, what is olive wine? You guys are gonna have to explain. That sounds good. Go ahead. Oh, also, I mean, we're doing an initial Vernon story, so obviously our boy had to show up representing for his boy. Yeah, we'll think about it. Poor Chungus. Chungus is having another Ursula story that does not involve Bob. So Chungus is wearing the Bob sweater tonight. Yes. <laughs> the boyfriend bucket. Yes, exactly. The boyfriend bucket. And we should also talk about the fan art really quick before we go much yes, further. Yes, the, the, the exclusive fan art from little-known fan artist Ursula K. Vernon. You're, yes, that's right. <laughs> the author also did her own cover art. She is just a disgustingly talented human being. Um... What's the name of the patch of land she owns? Dog Skull Patch? I believe it is called Dog... She bought a piece of property a couple of years ago called Dog Skull Patch. And they uh, they live in North Carolina. And they've been slowly... Is excavating the right word? Exploring? <coughs> I think exploring. Yeah, something like that. Dog Skull Patch. There we go, Compass Switch. Thank you. Um... Um, which, which Ursula first introduced to Twitter, as I recall, by taking a panning shot on her phone captioned with, Look! Look at all this tetanus! Only Ursula would be excited about the potential of finding tetanus. Exactly. So, since we have some raiders here with us tonight, why don't you give a recap about the structure of the, of the stream and what's coming up? I absolutely will. We do three things in the show. The first is an opening monologue. This is a chance for you to get settled, um, get hydrated, get a snack, make sure your pets are looked after, if you've got any meds you need, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and it's think of it like the trailers and the adverts at the cinema. You remember the cinema? 
from the before times. In the long, long ago. In the long, long ago. Where you could sit in the dark and the cold and watch a movie. So there's that. <sighs> we'll be back there again. Uh, and then we will do the first three chapters of Nine Goblins by T. Kingfisher, who looks a lot like Ursula K. Vernon in a hat. In is, fact, she looks almost exactly like T. Ursula's middle initial is K, right? I'm not imagining that. I don't know. I think I'm just going to assume that it's Ursula Vernon because I don't want to be in some kind of Berenstain Bears situation. You're just you're just in the in in this frame of mind where you want to give everybody a middle initial. Hiram it J. should be Ursula J. J Vernon. We'll just run this sucker into the ground. There you go, uh, and then we'll close out with some shenanigans, which is basically Magnus Arco's fan crack. It's usually Magnus. It's not always. But it is this week. Let's be honest. Yeah, it, it's usually this week. So yeah, that, that, and in amongst all that, we'll chat to you and explain some stuff about what's I going think, on with I us. Think, and... I think Chesney Cat's right. Uh, Le Guin's middle initial is J. Oh, there it's we K, are. Ursula K. Le Guin. Ursula K. Le Guin. Ursula K. Vernon. Ursula J. Alexander, as Becky has just pointed out. <laughs> exactly. Alexander J. Alexander and Alexander. There we are. <laughs> right, so how about an opening monologue? Oh yes, and what's an opening monologue we have for you today? This comes to us from Jax. Brace. That's right, Jax. It's all entirely your fault that we're doing Werner Herzog reviews Trader Joe's. Madness reigns. The first challenge your soul must endure is the parking lot. You wait with your vehicle, half-blocking traffic, creating a perfect circular vortex of anger that encompasses the street and the entrance to the store. Once you attain access to the lot, you discover that this is a false achievement. Other motorists stop and start with no apparent thought or plan. Turns once begun are quickly abandoned. <laughs> the driver seemingly immune to geometry. At last, a space opens up. But the price is having to enter the store. Inside, human beings scramble like beetles whose rock has been upended. Though the aisles are wide, it is impossible to avoid physical contact with your fellow shoppers. It is a grotesque parody of the bazaar at Marrakesh, as if dumb animals had been granted only the amount of sentience required to mock us. The aisles are not labelled. You must search for every item. The constant walking up and down causes a numbness that borders on profound despair. Your conscious mind registers merely annoyance, impatience, but on a cellular level your body cries out in weariness. The fatigue you feel is a warning. Millions of years of evolution trying to save you from becoming mired in the tar, from sinking into the warm blackness and ultimately being reclaimed by the earth itself. Be sure to get the dark chocolate peanut butter cups. They are right by the register. I can't believe you got through that with only <coughs> two corpses. And by the way, I grew up in California with Trader Joe's. The longing I feel for those dark chocolate peanut butter cups cannot be put into words. You see, now we've done this, I can also tell you my three favorite Werner Herzog stories. And Three? There are so many. The, the, okay, uh, fine. Here's the deal. You tell them your favorite Werner Herzog stories, and I will tell them my favorite Trader Joe's items. Fair. Fair. Um, Herzog, I, I forget who it was. I think it may have been Joaquin Phoenix. Saved Joaquin Phoenix from a serious car accident. His car crashed, and Herzog was behind him, and he literally just got out, pulled him out of the wreckage, went, you are well, left, and drove off. Okay. Um, so is that one story? That's one story. I could live... My entire rest of my life on Trader Joe's olive hummus. Yes. I've attempted to recreate it here in the UK with mixed success. But that used to be like my... I'm literally drooling at this thought. That used to be like my favorite Friday lunch treat as I would brave the parking lot of Trader Joe's at lunch and get a tub of green olive hummus and a bag of pita chips and a box of those dark peanut butter chocolate cups. None would survive. Okay, your turn. Go. Um, Vernon was once shot during an interview. This is on YouTube. Uh, it was, I believe, with um, 
fellow Manx film journalist, and you know sooner or later we will meet to decide who has the ultimate control of the island's cinematic prowess, Mark Kermode. And in the middle of nowhere, there was this, in the middle of the interview, there was this kind of dull, pfft, and Werner goes, oh. And Kermode's like, you've just been shot. It is not a significant wound. We will continue. And he finished the interview. Yeah, to, to quote Compost Witch, that escalated quickly. Second favorite Trader Joe's fact. Um, uh, because Compost Witch mentioned this. Yes, JoJo's is what they call their like generic <coughs> coated <coughs> Oreo cookies that they come up with at Christmas. <coughs> and they come up with all these different variety packages of them. <coughs> um, like, like peppermint and those are the, the dark chocolate peppermint ones are obscene! And like gingerbread and white chocolate eggnog and... Um, Quickly, quickly, tell the third story. Uh, Herzog was, I'm actually just looking up the full details of this one now. One second. Plain shortbread with chocolate and sprinkles. Huh? I don't know. I have no idea what it is. But yeah, JoJo's are so, so good. I... Uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Herzog was, was I, I believe, thrown out of a directorial group. Um, and in in the manner that only an aging a Teutonic German nihilist could possibly do, um, got to the door and went, Happy Christmas, losers, slammed it and walked off. That's such a Werner Herzog thing to do. I want him and Bill Murray. Do you remember that old um, late night with somebody... There's this one guy who used to do a show, which was just him wandering around parties between midnight and 4 a.m. Yes. Um, I want him and Bill Murray to do that. Just crashing people's parties, doing their dishes, restocking which, their which, wine cabinets. By all accounts, Murray does. I know, I know. That's why I want the two of them to have a show doing this. It sounds you crazy. Know, th there are multiple accounts of Murray showing up at student parties going, Hey, let me do your dishes. And, you know, just hopping out of the bushes in Central Park and going, ah, and frightening people and then going, you know what? No one will ever believe you and leaving. That so lost and hurts <coughs> exactly. Okay, last Trader Joe's. My favorite all time thing, the one thing that if I could only ever have one thing from them ever, 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 ever again. The cocoa powder salted almonds. We bought three packs we of those. We bought three tubs of them the last time we were at a Trader Joe's, and they all came back in my luggage. I think I put them in the freezer, and they lasted six months. I was so careful with It them. should be pointed out as well. Marguerite writes very joint, jaunty messages to, to TSA. <laughs> oh, yeah. But can, okay, so here's... Let me come on camera for this one, because this is weird. This is a good one. Hi, everybody. So um, here in the UK, you can only buy ibuprofen, like Advil, in 10 tab packets. Um, that is insufficient for my needs. So when we go to the US, where you can buy, you know, big 500 count bottles of the generic stuff, I buy a couple of them and I dump them up into a Ziploc bag and I put them in my luggage with the label and a little note to TSA that says, this is Advil. Here's where I bought it. Here's the receipts. Because otherwise I never know if they're going to be like, what is this crazy lady doing trying to hide drugs? And they're going to take my Advil out of my backpack. It's the stupid little things. Right then. Should we do a story? Shall we set the scene and talk about some oh, goblins? Oh, no. No, no. We have, we have some news. We have what's new this week. Oh, yeah. We have to do what's new this week because we have a very exciting thing that is new this week. We have new staff and you already know them. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce assistant producer Jen Hill, who is already in the chat, I believe, as Duck Pond. Fellow moderator Duck Pond. Fellow moderator Duck Pond is coming aboard as an assistant producer That's for the show. Right. Duck is helping me uh, <coughs> build all the lovely behind the scenes things and do all of the scheduling and all of that good stuff. And I am very grateful to have her joining us. So hooray for Ducky. Welcome aboard, Ducky. So what's new with you this week, honey? Um, my favorite episode of The West Wing is Celestial Navigation. Where you did that last week. Try again. <laughs> I got some news today I can't talk about yet. Uh, How does a, that feel to say? But it's very good and very fun, and I'm really happy. 
Um, the news I can talk about. No, I can't talk about the other thing either. There's a book I can't tell you anything about, which I have to write in six weeks. And once that's formally announced, I can tell you why I have to write it in six weeks. But it involves doing a lot of research, and it's basically very similar to the Day of the Doctor book, which was, is pretty cool. And then, and I mean... Needless to say, things are going to get pretty busy. You know, <laughs> not that things were at a leisurely pace beforehand, but uh, some sub priorities have shifted around as a result of embargoed good news. So, so, the, so we got a lot on. The, the, the thing is that they want a first draft in six weeks. And it's, it's genre nonfiction. And it's me. Yeah, okay. I don't know if Alistair's told you this story, but you know what NaNoWriMo <coughs> is, where you write a novel in a month, and most novels are forty to 60,000 words. Alistair did one month where he did like 137,000 words of non journalism, so I rate his chances, and on, literally he's done this before. Um, so it's just going to be a lot of late nights and butt-in-chair time and well-stocked snack supplies, I think. Snack. Hydration. So much hydration. Rehydration salts, carrots, mozzarella. All nine yards. But yes, I'm I'm really, really happy that these two projects look like they're lining up in basically the exact right way. <coughs> I will, Zalia, thank you. And um the really interesting thing is that if the this all shakes out the way it should, then I need to step change in my approach to my career because I need an agent and I'm now at a point where I'm able to conceivably go hi I have sold these books to these people I have done this without assistance I need an adult Perhaps you need, you, adult. Uh, perhaps you need an additional adult I, I need a secondary adult perhaps that, that secondary adult is you <laughs> Why don't you take a sip? <coughs> quick, quick. Let's use a hydrate here. Don't dehydrate. There we go. Have a hydrate. Oh. Much better. So yes, um, that's fun, <laughs> uh, and and all, all ticking over quite nicely. Um, and yeah, we have new stuff and. Uh, Doug, Doug Bond coming aboard is going to be fantastic and it's going to be one of those things which you won't see notable change for for a little while and then suddenly you'll see a lot of really positive change and I mean I can tell you now this is one of the things that Margaret's been working really hard on for the last two weeks because she's figured out a little while ago that she does the work of seven people a and, number greater than one and wrote the job descriptions for all the jobs that she does and then we began interviewing people to take on those roles and then we realized that none of those roles could be done by one person yeah well they shouldn't be done by one person how about that so so it is it is a time of growth at ea we are bringing aboard lots of people to help with lots of different projects and that's exciting and it's a lot of upfront energy investment so so the overwork is a bit more skewed pardon me i'm yawning than usual right now uh, so growth is good. Uh, properly getting people in a position of, you know, comfort and support is is a thing that we are doing, and it is taking time and lots of energy. But then it will be happening, and there will be lots and lots of people doing lots and lots of things. And the theory is, uh, I will have time to read books for fun again. I put it this way, by the time I get everybody onboarded, I still won't have a PS5 to play Mass Effect. My I, my sincere hope is that somehow we live in a timeline where there's everything is such a gentle, inoffensive 19, 1990s rom-com. Have a good night, Specky. Have a good night, Specky, that I am able to somehow acquire a PS5 and a really spanking new TV for her to play it on, because it would be so good, but... I hear you, Cato. Honestly, it sounds like a great problem to have. I would love to be in a position where we're like, we brought six people to do these things, and now we need these 14 more people. That would be that would be perfect, in my opinion. And we, I'm sure we'll get there. It's just a matter of time. And this is across the board. This is with the, the stream and with the full lid and with um, the with, EA shows. Yep. This is everything we do. And we're now at the point where we finally realize that 
we don't have to do everything ourselves and we will actually die. And, we're, and more importantly, I think we've been confronted with proof that it's physically impossible for us to keep doing all of this ourselves. So, so m more hands, more better. Yeah. Which in Latin should probably be the, the motto above the door. Really? We have too many models above the door. As long as it says vampires, nice try, go away. I think we're good. Okay. So, story, huh? Yeah, let us let us set the <coughs> scene. So, shall we describe... I think the very front of the book gives the little strap line, doesn't it? This is very Terry Gilliam-esque fantasy. I have no strap line. Uh, quick, hang on a second. Well, why don't you talk about... Insofar as this is the type of high fantasy that I really love because... I believe it's described book as a book of low fantasy. Yes, because it's Very not high fantasy low at all. Fantasy. <coughs> it is. I, I think <coughs> I am not a Pratchett fan. Please, please don't, please don't. You know, get out the pitchforks and torches. I'm, I'm just not. Um, here we go. How about this? Why don't you read that to start with? This is a work of fiction. Any resemblance, persons, places, large waterfowl, events, or actual historical personages, living, dead, or trapped in a hellish afterlife, is purely coincidental. There was another line. Oh, and the book is dedicated to... For Kevin, who had to put up with this story for a very long time. <laughs> So we, um, before we kick off, just to say, we do have content warnings for this oh, story. We? Yeah, those content warnings are death and dying, horror themes, socio-political themes, violence, gross food, exhaustion, overwork, and accents. There's going to be so many accents tonight, folks. I, uh, I got complimented on, do on doing a perfect Bristolian accent on Ditch Diggers today. Really? Yeah. That sounds fantastic. <coughs> so please do take a look at the content warnings for more details. They are broken down by chapter. And a huge thank you <coughs> to Compost Witch. <coughs> oh, Sorry. dear. Are I'm all, all right? right. Have some more tea, please. I'm all right. And a huge thanks to Compost Witch, who helped us, who helped put together the content warnings and who has a little bit of commentary in there as well. Um, please be advised that the commentary is spoilery for the book, but it is all available at that URL, Bedtime Stories CW, um, and they're all broken down by um, chapter as well. So yep. you can follow along as you like. Shall we? And away we go. Nine Goblins, a novella by T. Kingfisher. It was gruel again for breakfast. It had been gruel for dinner the night before. It would be gruel sandwiches for lunch, a dish only possible with goblin gruel, which was burnt solid and to be trusted not to ooze off of the bread. Usually had unidentifiable lumps of something in it. Sometimes the lumps had legs. Once, Corporal Algol had found an eyeball in his gruel, the memory of which he carried with him like a good luck charm and inflicted regularly on his fellow soldiers. Did I ever tell you chaps about the time I found an eyeball? Yeah. Oh. Algol wasn't a bad sort, really. He was bigger than usual for a goblin, a whopping four foot ten, with broad, knotty shoulders and enormous feet. He had the ochre grey skin of a hill goblin, and he wasn't all that bright, but then he was a goblin officer. Smart goblins became mechanics. Dumb goblins became soldiers. Really, dumb goblins became officers. One of the latter was gesturing grandly from the top of a nearby rise. Nobody in the 19th Infantry, better known as the Wine and Niners, could hear what he was saying, and, well, that was probably a good thing. If you couldn't hear what the officer said, you couldn't be said to be disobeying orders. <coughs> it was amazing how selectively deaf goblin soldiers could be, particularly when words like charge and advance and get your finger out of that soldier were involved. What do you think he's on about? asked Weatherby, jerking his thumb in the direction of the officer. Everybody turned and looked, since there was nothing else to do. They had been sitting in the middle of a stony wasteland for a week, and it was either watch the officers or watch the bird. 
There was only the one bird, and it had been hanging around waiting for something to die for most of that week. The officer was waving his arms wildly now and hopping on one foot, like a man being attacked by ants. His red coat flapped in the breeze, like shabby scarlet wings. We're going to move out, said Murray. You think? Murray nodded. He's making a big speech. He only does that when he thinks we might get into a scrape with the enemy. The enemy's not going to come at us here, so we must be moving out. For a goblin? Murray was a genius. He'd washed out of the mechanics corps for being too good at his job. You see, goblins appreciate machines that are big and clunky and have lots of spiky bits sticking off them, which break down and explode and take half the core with them. That's how you know it worked. If it couldn't kill goblins, how could you trust it to kill the enemy? Murray made small, neat, efficient devices that didn't even maim anybody during the construction phases. Nobody believed for a minute that things would work, and Murray was sent to the infantry in disgrace. When his designs later proved dramatically successful, leaving enormous craters in the enemy ranks, and on one particularly notable occasion, causing an entire platoon of elves to simultaneously wet themselves on the field of battle, nobody could remember who'd built them. There was such a rapid turnover, you see, in the Mechanics Corps, that the people who'd thrown him out were now mostly scattered in bits across the landscape, or had transferred back to Goblin Home to teach. Murray was therefore the exception to the wine in 19th, and indeed to most of the surviving Goblin infantry. Too dumb to desert, too smart to die. <coughs> Even this was more clever than accurate. There are situations where no amount of smarts keeps you from getting killed. Bloghammer had been sitting down at breakfast a week ago, as canny a goblin veteran as you could wish for, and one of the supply rocks had gotten the sweaty claws. The gigantic bird had been passing directly overhead, and the elephant it was carrying popped right out of its talons and landed directly on Blockhammer's head. Also on his body, his camp stool, and all the space in a 15-foot radius around him. When they went to bury him, they couldn't figure out which bits were Blockhammer and which bits were the elephant, so the 19th had buried his sword instead. They rolled a stone over it, and Murray wrote R.I.P. Block Hammer, capital B, capital L, small O, capital K, small H, small A, capital M, E, R. Murray's genius did not extend the spelling. And the silker had sung a goblin lament. Everyone was very moved, and toasted Blockhammer's memory repeatedly over the next batch of elephant gruel. It was possible the gruel also contained bits of Blockhammer. Nobody wanted to dwell on that. The other half of the saying wasn't too accurate either. Weatherby, for example, had deserted no less than 15 times, and he was so dumb it was remarkable he hadn't been tapped as officer material. It was really very easy to desert. People did it all the time, but Weatherby? Weatherby had made an art of it. He would nod to the rest of the 19th as they sat around the campfire and say, Right, I'm off then! and then walk in a straight line until he hit the edge of the Goblin Army encampment. Once he was 50 feet from the edge of the camp, Weatherby proceeded to rip off his clothes, run to the nearest hill or tree stump, and begin dancing wildly in the moonlight, <coughs> while shouting, I'm free, you swords free! I'm a free goblin! Woohoo! Eventually, the guards would come and get him and bring him home. His clothes were usually a loss. Since the Goblin Army had blown up all, had blown almost all its uniform budget on red coats for the officers, everybody was wearing loincloths from home anyway, so nobody much noticed. A runner came up to the edge of the fire where the 19th was sitting. New orders, Sergeant, he said, saluting the silker. Nasilka muttered something under her breath. She was the ranking member of the 19th. Now, Bloke Hammer had been splattered, followed by Murray and Algol, who were corporals, and everybody else who weren't. You could tell the ranks by the stripes on the loincloth, although the system had drawbacks if you were trying to tell the difference between the general and somebody who just didn't do laundry often enough. Nasilka didn't like being in charge. She was good at it. Didn't like it. 
She'd been the oldest of six children and was the veteran of three campaigns, and as a result, both responsibility and suspicion of rank were etched in the Silka's bones. Finding herself as the senior member of the Wine and Niners was like a constant itch between her shoulder blades. What's the word, then? She asked. General Globulich says to break camp. We're moving out. He saluted again. He had to be new. Nobody was that enthusiastic after the first month. We'll do, said Nasilka, and waited. The runner saluted again. He was a scrawny little green fellow, probably with imp blood somewhere a few generations back. He saluted for the fourth time, hard enough to bruise his forehead this time. Sergeant Nasilka took pity on him and saluted back, and he ran off to the next camp. Nasilka was a female goblin, which meant that everybody was a little scared of her. Occasionally you saw women in the enemy armies, generally slim, willowy-looking young women with long bows and grim expressions. She wondered if everybody on their side tiptoed around them like naughty children with an unpredictable school teacher. Somehow she doubted it. There was nothing slim or willowy about Nasilka. She was built like a chunk of granite, and she could carry a live boar under one arm. The only concession to femininity was that she wore her hair in a bun instead of a long queue, and she wore slightly fewer earrings than everybody else. All right, maggots, you heard the men, she growled. Pack up and move out. Most of the whining 19th groaned and grumbled and sulked. Murray and Algol, however, got to their feet and went to start packing their kits, and eventually the rest followed. Sergeant Nasilka had just shoved her spiked club into her belt when a flash of red indicated that the officer had returned to his position on the cliff. Now he was mounted on his parade pig, a big white porker with its hooves polished and ribbons twined in its tail. He made a sweeping gesture with his sword. The pig squealed. Well, that's our cue, Nasilka said. She slung her pack over her shoulder and looked around her unit. They were mostly packed. Murray was helping the two newest recruits get their gear arranged. Algol had the lead rope for the supply goat. Luba had a finger up his nose. Move out. The wine in Niners moved out. Chapter 2. How the Goblin War, if you ask the humans, or the glorious conflict resisting the ongoing human aggression, if you ask the Goblin Generals, or the bloody miserable mess, if you ask the 19th, got started really depends on which side was doing the talking. <coughs> humans and elves will tell you that goblins are stinking, slinking, filthy, sheep-stealing, cattle-rustling, hen-house raiding, disgusting, smelly, obnoxious, rude, unmannerly, and violent. The goblins would actually agree with all of that, and they might add cowardly and lazy to the list as well. You see, goblins have a lot of flaws, but they have very few illusions. As far as the human side of the war is concerned, one day the goblins, who had been keeping to themselves pretty well in the high hills and deep mires, came out to a human settlement, riding their pigs and waving banners and holding a list of really laughable demands. The humans, of course, refused. And the next day, they were hip deep in short green and ogre people with tusks, the humans retaliated, the goblins retaliated for the retaliation, the elves got involved, the orcs got involved because the elves got involved. <coughs> and by the end of six months, it was a horrible, churning, entrenched mess where troops on both sides sat around for weeks on end and occasionally, but only occasionally, ran at each other screaming. Again, the goblins would agree with most of that account, but there was more to it. You see, once upon a time, goblins had lived everywhere. Like rabbits, goblins are an immensely adaptable, quick-breathing lot, capable of living under practically any conditions. There are hill goblins and marsh goblins, forest goblins who live in trees and savannah goblins who live in networked tunnels like prairie dog towns. There are desert goblins and jungle goblins, miniature island goblins and heavy-bodied tundra goblins. Goblins live everywhere. Wherever a goblin happens to live, he complains about it. Constantly. This is actually a sign of affection. 
A desert goblin will complain endlessly about the beastly heat and the dreadful dryness and the spiky cactus. He will show you how his sunburn is peeling, and the place where the rattlesnake bit him, and the place where he bit the rattlesnake. He will be thoroughly, cheerfully miserable. If you took him away from the desert, though, he'd be lost. He wouldn't know what to complain about. He might make a few half-hearted attempts, but he would eventually lapse into confused silence and return as quickly as possible to the desert he loves. Complaining is how he shows he's paying attention to all the little nuances of his home. This is basically goblin psychology in a nutshell. Goblin cooks wait in anticipation for the rude comments about the flavour. A goblin courting the lady goblin of his dreams will point out the new lumps and splotches on her skin and ask if she's been sick lately because she looks off colour and, hey, is that a tick behind her left ear? Goblins are in many ways stoics. When they're genuinely unhappy, they shut up, they put their heads down and they just try and blunder through it. Goblin divorces are notable for their lack of screaming. If a goblin eats something without complaining, it was so bad he doesn't want to dwell on it. Gruel, among the 19th, by the way, had recently reached this point, and breakfast had become a silent, glum affair. A goblin trying to make the best of things is a very, very sad sight, indeed. So, the goblins lived over much of the land and woods and plains and deserts and whatnot, and it all rang with the cheery sounds of goblin complaints. Until humans came. They came in small groups at first, and cleared little clearings, and built little houses. And the goblins didn't really mind. They're cowards, after all. And there was plenty of room, so they had no desire to forcibly evict the humans. They just avoided those places. The clearings got bigger. The houses got bigger. The goblins kept avoiding them, until one day there was hardly any place that you weren't avoiding. And one by one, tribe by tribe, the goblins would melt quietly away into the wilderness to impose on the hospitality of the next tribe over. Sometimes, of course, it wasn't that easy. In a few cases, goblins wound up living on mountaintops and tunnelling down instead of running away. On islands, they would have to steal boats and rafts from the humans and strike out across the oceans. Occasionally, they couldn't find another island without people on it, and a whole ro colony of raft goblins sprang up, travelling with the currents, living on fish and seabirds, and whatever they could steal from human settlements. A knot of goblins even got stuck in a park for years, every avenue of escape having been filled in by a reasonably large city. They survived by panhandling and occasionally mugging, and a, few num and a fair number established themselves successfully in the sewers, where they breed riding rats the size of ponies and wrestle white alligators in the dark. By and large, though, the goblins went deeper and deeper into the wilderness, and the wilderness got smaller and tamer and tamer. And then one day, a goblin scouting for new territory found himself standing on a beach, gazing out across the western sea. It was the end of the road. They had been pushed right to the edge of the continent, and there was simply no place else for them to go. Oh yeah, I'm good. Just take a minute. Chapter 3. Sings to trees had hair the colour of sunlight and pardon me. <coughs> Bless you. Right. Oh yeah. I'm gonna start that over. Yes. Have some more tea while you're at it. Thank you. Sings to trees had hair the colour of sunlight and ashes, delicately pointed ears, and eyes the translucent green of new leaves. His shirt was off, he had the sort of tanned muscle acquired from years of healthy outdoor living, and you could have sharpened a sword on his cheekbones. He was saved from being a young maiden's fantasy, unless she was a very peculiar young maiden, by the fact that he was buried up to the shoulder in the unpleasant end of a very pregnant unicorn. Bits of unicorn dung, not noticeably more ethereal than horse dung, were sliding down his arm, and every time the mare had a contraction, he lost feeling in his hand. <coughs> it had been nearly two hours. The ground was hard and cold, and his knees felt like live coals wrapped in ice. She'd kicked him twice, and if Sings to Trees hadn't known that it was impossible, he'd have begun to suspect that the unicorn had arranged a breech birth out of spite. 
No, no, he was being unfair. It couldn't be any more fun for her than it was for him, just because he didn't really like unicorns. Shouldn't let it cloud his judgment. He sighed and tried yet again to get a grip on one of the foal's legs. Unicorn foals had hooves as delicate as glass bells, naturally and however adorable... Unicorn foals had hooves as delicate as glass bells, naturally, and however adorable they were when tripping lightly across the meadow, they were pure bloody torture to grab in the slippery less than in the hospital. <laughs> Start the corpse counter. <coughs> Unicorn foals had hooves as delicate as glass bells, naturally, and however adorable they were when tripping lightly across the meadow, they were pure bloody torture to grab in the slippery, less than hospitable environment inside the mother unicorn. If you could just get the little monster turned, a few good pushes should do it. The problem is getting a good grip. He wrote out yet another contraction with gritted teeth. Sing to trees loved all living creatures and loved them with a broad, impartial love. The sort of love that rescues baby bats and stays up nights feeding them. One drop of milk and mealworm mix at a time. He splintered the legs of injured deer, treated mites in the ears of foxes, gave charcoal to colky wivens. No beast was too ugly, too monstrous, too troublesome. He had once donned smoked glass goggles and shoulder-length cowhide gloves to sit up with an egg-bound cockatrice for three days, giving it calcium tablets and oiling its cloacal vents every four hours. Since it had been nursing a pocket full of baby hummingbirds at the time, which had to be fed sugar water every 15 minutes, 16 hours out of the day, it had been an extraordinary three days. He still had nightmares about it. <coughs> but he never really warmed to unicorns. Possibly it was because they didn't need him. Regular elves loved unicorns as they loved all beautiful creatures, and a unicorn with so much as a stubbed hoof could turn up at the door of any elf in the world and be assured of treatment. Seeing as the trees that hardly ever had to deal with them, and honestly, he preferred it that way. But when somebody needed to actually reach a hand in there and turn a foal around, suddenly the unicorn lovers of the world melted away, and it was down to sinks to trees and a barn and a bucket of soapy water, and the hind end of a unicorn. Of course. As if to punctuate this thought, the unicorn kicked him again. He grunted. He was pretty sure the mare was smart enough to know that he was helping her. He just didn't think she cared. He got a grip on something that felt like a wee little hawk and started the tricky process of hauling, coaxing, and generally begging the tiny creature to turn around. Another contraction came along and he willed his numb fingers to hold on to the foal's leg. His fingers, uh, his fingers laughed at him. Give him trolls any day. A thousand pounds of muscle and bone, froggish, goatish creatures the size of bears, with enormous curling horns that could smash through a concrete wall. They were ideal patients. Trolls might not be more talkative than unicorns, but they understood every word you said, and if they had come to you for help, they would trust you to the ends of the earth. You could soar off a troll's leg, and it would look at you with huge, tearful eyes the size of dinner plates, and hold still while you did it. If you told them to come back in a week for a checkup, a week later, there they'd be, as soon as the sun went down, squatting patiently in the vegetable patch, ready to be poked and prodded all over again. Seeing the trees actually quite liked trolls. <coughs> <coughs> and they were grateful, too. Not a month went by when he didn't wake up to see gigantic cloven hoof prints around the yard, and half a billy goat left draped across a tree stump. Not like unicorns. As soon as the foal was able to walk, the man would be gone like a shot. He'd never see her again. Come to think of it, maybe that wasn't a bad thing. Okay, he said to the unicorn, mildly surprised at the weariness in his own voice. I think I've got it presenting right. Let's give this a try. Push. The mare pulled. The mare pushed. He pulled. There was a brief, horrible moment where nothing happened and Sings the Trees saw another two hours of internal fumbling ahead of him, and then with almost absurd ease, the foal slid out and hit him in the chest. The mare grunted in triumph, and he fell over backwards with his arms full of slimy baby unicorn. Its first act was to kick him with its adorable little hooves. He gazed at the barn rafters while it beat a tattoo on his ribs, and it hurt, but his knees hurt worse. Okay, not much more to go. He could handle this. 
He staggered upright, shuffled on his knees to the end of the unicorn he hadn't seen much of this evening, and dumped the foal in front of her. She bent down, snuffled at the tiny creature, tapped it delicately with her foot-long horn as if to test it, and then began licking at its damp white hide. The bedraggled foal lifted its muzzle and made a faint, squeaky snort of protest. Even to someone who didn't much care for unicorns, at another time this scene would be pure magic. But there was gunk from the hind end of a unicorn plastered clear up the side of his face, delicate hoof prints turning purple across his ribcage, and he felt about a thousand years old. He got painfully to his feet, his knees had moved through the on-fire stage, and now felt as if tiny wolverines were chewing under the kneecaps, and staggered outside to the pump. He tried to, grip the, to grab the pump handle, and for an awful moment his hand wouldn't close on it. <sighs> well, no surprise there. His right arm, you know, the one that had been inside the unicorn, <coughs> <coughs> was red and white and bruising magnificently where contractions had smacked his bicep repeatedly against the mare's pelvic bones. And there was unicorn crap and amniotic fluid and bits of straw all over him. Seeing as the tree slumped against the pump handle, moaned, and managed to grab it with his left hand. By dropping most of his weight on it, with all the grace of a sack of potatoes, he got enough water out to sluice the worst of the muck from him. It was icy cold, but he didn't really care. There was soap somewhere. He found it. It didn't lather well, but at least he made a symbolic effort before giving up. He ducked his head back in the barn and glanced over at the mother and child who were arranged in a beautifully domestic scene, as tranquil as the dawn. White hide glowed in the muted lamplight. You'd never know she'd spent hours in labour. There was unicorns for you. Pausing only to make sure the afterbirth had passed with no difficulties, he considered patting the foal, but the mare, in great that she was, stamped a hoof at him and lowered her horn warningly, seeing as the trees limped out of the barn. The moon glared down like a bar of soap in a bucket of cold sky. The path up to the house was packed earth, washed blue and black in the moonlight, and approximately 1,000 miles long. Several ages of the earth passed while he toiled up to the house, punctuated by the bright jangle of pain from his knees. A coyote with one eye and a ragged ear was stretched out across the porch rug. When the elf was close enough, it lifted its head, pricked up the good ear, and came down to meet him. A cold nose touched his hand and the tail made a careless motion that was certainly not a wag. Fleabane had a certain amount of dignity, despite his name, but might conceivably be mistaken for one. Sings to trees wound a cold hand in the coarse hair behind the coyote's ears, and rubbed affectionately. They walked the last few yards up to the house together, and then Fleabane flopped back down on the rug, and, Fle and Sings to trees went inside. There were animals to be fed, yet... A bat hanging upside down in the closet, who was thankfully past needing ground mealworm shoved down its throat. An orphaned raccoon, who was just starting on solid food and needed warm milk with a little bread. And, of course, the gargoyle. He dumped a handful of dried mealworms on the closet floor, heard a grumpy chitter in response, and left the bat to its own devices. There was cold chicken left, and he divided it up carefully, a quarter for a sandwich and three quarters for the gargoyle. He built up the fire and set milk to warm by the hearth. The warmth was wonderful, if painful, on his cold hands. He started to sink down into the rug in front of the fireplace, caught himself and lurched to his feet, because he knew if he didn't stare, dare stop moving, if he sat down to rest, he wasn't going to get back up in a hurry. The back door opened with a wooden groan. He took three steps forward, turned and hucked the battered remains of the chicken onto the roof. A stony chuckling came down to him, followed by the crunch of chicken bones. Satisfied, Sings to Trees went back inside to feed the raccoon. He must have made tea at some point, because when he woke up there was a stone-cold mug of it next to his elbow and a half-eaten sandwich sliding off his knee. The raccoon cub was asleep on his lap, in the wreckage of what had been a saucer of bread soaked in warm milk. Perhaps it was just as well he hadn't bothered with a shirt. It looked like most of the milk had gone into the raccoon anyway, and his sandwich had a distinctly gnawed look. Some days that was all you could ask for. Sings to Trees gave up even pretending he was awake. He put the raccoon to bed, toweled off the remnants of both their dinners as best he could, and limped to the bedroom. He had just enough energy to remove his shoes, and then sleep crept up and hit him. 
<coughs> and we'll leave that there for tonight, I think. I love Fleabane. The, uh, I love the whole menagerie of the scene. <coughs> Maybe not so much the unicorns, <coughs> <the> but... <laughs> the asshole unicorn. and <sighs> Exactly. Exactly. Fleabane, the charmingly disreputable coyote. Uh, and the baby panda, the baby cu- um, raccoon. raccoon, the trash panda. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Shall we take a quick break? Yes, let's. All right, everybody. We're going to take-, take a stretch break. We'll be back in a second. We're going to take a couple minutes to refill beverages. We'll- Why don't you do the same while we're the way and we'll meet you back. Remember, there'll be a countdown uh, when we're coming back. So if you haven't seen it on the screen, you've got at least 60 seconds and we'll see you in a few.
That's better. Okay. Oops. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Hello. Fantastic. Um, isn't Oops. this fun? Oops. Well, I think n n all, all of my magical buttons didn't work. Guys, the frame is lava. Yes. <laughs> yes, the frame is lava. Sorry, sorry, everybody. As you could tell, we upgraded, we upgraded the camera scheme yep. for for this, and uh, I, I didn't test all of the return bits properly, apparently. So, um, oops. Oh well. Oh, you you want to see what else we probably should have had on screen for the last little bit that I forgot to do? <coughs> It was supposed to show you the cover of the book while he was reading it, but I messed up. <coughs> oh dear. Pardon me. Um, so shall we? Shall we maybe go on to shenanigans now? Let's maybe. <coughs> shenanigans. Yes. Let's. <coughs> oh dear. Do you need to step uh. away for a moment? I don't think so. Um, okay. We have a stream deck, dudes. <laughs> I have. I'm using a stream deck. Second breakfast. Um, I just didn't check that bit. It's yeah. on my phone. Thank you. Isn't it a nice one? Um, this where is did we Pike Place. Yeah, we got them at Pike Market in Seattle. <sighs> And they made it home in one piece, for which I'm very amazing. grateful. Okay, I, I'm one of those people who has a mug for each beverage. And that is the honey and lemon mug. Yes. Set, exactly. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for the, the kind wishes. I am actually all right. It's... <coughs> <coughs> I woke up yesterday morning with a pounding headache. And it felt like the front 25% of my head was in a different time zone. And um, I passed out for most of the day. We're pretty certain it was some and kind of... by pass out, he means sleep. Don't worry, anybody. It's okay. We're pretty certain it was very fast burn food poisoning. But it's is, aggravated his throat again. Yeah, but this is just the after effects of it. It's it's a thing. I'm I'm dealing with it. It's fine. Um, it's frustrating. It, it's it's okay. frustrating. I'm so much better today than I was yesterday. Uh, I was awake for about half an hour yesterday. You know. Um, you are awake more than that, but but you your body needed rest, and we gave it lots of rest. The thing that, that I'm working really hard on, on not obsessing over is I was ill a month ago. I really don't want this to be a regular thing, you know, and because we're dealing with a lot of, because of, of the fact I, po I probably have sleep apnea and we're dealing with that and we're waiting for a full diagnosis on it. There's, there's a lot of kind of medical stuff. <coughs> None of which is bad. And I mean, this is the, this is the absolute genius of, of Marguerite in that uh, when we first started looking into all of this, literally the first thing she did was, please give him a full raft of blood tests. Okay, the blood tests for the really scary stuff, do them. And then she literally stood over my shoulder and went, does he have cancer? No. Does he have heart problems? No. Is his liver fine? Yes. Hmm. Yes, basically. I made the doctor say, answer all of his fears, <coughs> and, and that's good. Um, but we're, we're exploring some other stuff, and he, this lingering cough and his air passages are being a little aggravated, and it's causing the coughing. So, yeah. So sorry, it, everybody. It sounds really bad, I know, and it sounds gross. And it's not. It, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually genuinely okay. Uh, it's just... Learning to look after myself and making all those hilarious, mild lifestyle tweaks, which are almost impossible in a pandemic here, and that you have to do anyway. I hear you, Compost Witch. You know, just download me into a robot body, please. I will miss sensations, though. To be fair. And haptic feedback, dude. 
Marguerite, can you come <laughs> look after me? Uh, Marguerite is the daughter of a nurse and keeps very detailed files and has been a health advocate for a while now. Um, it's because you need one. You all, if there's one piece of advice I would give anybody in the chat who is dealing with a health issue, it's find a responsible adult and ask them to come with you and make them ask questions and tell yeah. them what you're afraid of and have them help you go through it. Like advocacy is a really good thing because when we're hurt or we're scared or we're anxious, we may not think of the questions we need answered or articulate the things that concern us and having somebody who can do that on your behalf can save a lot of stress and anxiety. And honestly, this is one of the things which this not awful, but demanding year is teaching me. I, for all sorts of reasons, um, like I said, it's a whole other episode. For all sorts of reasons, my whole life, I have been Alistair who's fine. Uh, my job is to be fine. I get good grades. I get the job I need. I, I am the rock against which other people brace themselves, all that kind of shit. And no, no one can do that all the time. And I have had the most negative piece of social engineering I've ever had inflated on me, aside from the belief that because I'm fat, I'm worthless, um, is... Which is not true. Which is not true. <coughs> it's not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. Okay. No, no. Um, is that the best possible thing I can do is, you know, least said, soon as mended, keep calm and carry on. No, fuck that shit. Fuck it right in the ear. Seriously. If something is bad, is bad, deal with it. Is bad. And just across the course of the last six months, I've been very aware of how I've started to turn from, oh, well, I don't really want to do this, to, okay, what's next week's doctor's appointment? Cool. And it helps, and it sucks, but you kind of have to do it. And I'm going to be fine, guys. It's probably going to take most of the rest of the year to shake off a couple of the things which I've been carrying with me for a ridiculous amount of time, but I'm going to be fine. And, yeah. We're going to get there. We are. It may take time, and we're very fortunate to currently live in a country with nationalized health care, such as it is, um, which means that although processes may take time to navigate, we're not out of pocket anything. Um, we have friends who have had major organ replacements <laughs> um, and who didn't go bankrupt because they lived with nationalized health care. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it all feels a little bit <coughs> like weld this plate and hold that down at the moment, but it won't feel like that forever. And um, you have to be fine if you're not fine, there's something wrong with you and there's something wrong with you, you'll, you'll cause trouble for other people. Yeah, Kiwi. I hear that. Some I hear that a lot too. It's always wrong. Have a good one, AR Crap. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Oh yes. Yeah. Also, I'm just glad this has been brought up. Doctor visits are good. Finding going to a therapist and working on my health, mental health. I am so proud of you. Therapy is fucking great. If you can do any form of it whatsoever, do it seriously. I have had counselling three times in my life. And two of those times, it has directly saved my life is too strong a word. It has directly steered me onto a much, much better course. And if nothing else, the first time was when I unloaded all the stuff that was going on and my therapist went, wow, do you want a biscuit? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just having someone outside your own head, just having someone who's there to externalize all the stuff which you're doing and and you think is stupid and you think is 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 the architecture of your brain that you have to deal with just having that is incredibly helpful and i'm i'm gonna climb on my nationalistic show my kind of nationalist soapbox a little bit here and also my mildly gendered soapbox british guys are fucking worthless at addressing their emotional and psychological health we suck at it 
because we have been conditioned to believe that if you cry that means you're gay and if you, and, the, and also that means that's bad and it's not <clears throat> and the emotional health is something which you just have to deal with and shove under the carpet and ignore yeah by the way i do not keep calm and carry on i i get angry and kick things over until they change yes the best explanation of a therapist i've ever heard is a common sense filter perfect that's a great description <coughs> so yes please if you have access to resources you are not a horrible burden for using them they exist for your yeah. benefit use them they will help we're all fixable just make sure you fix yourself on your own terms you know anyway let's talk about a book real quick yeah i got my copy of this today Quarantine Comics by Rachel Smith. <coughs> <coughs> Rachel is one of the best uh, independent comic creators in the UK. Her work's very funny and very kind and very perceptive and deals directly with all of this stuff. And Quarantine Comics is a collection of the 200 strips she wrote across the course of the initial lockdown. And it is, I mean... <coughs> It, it's about as perfect a uh, snapshot as you can possibly get. It starts with uh, just before things close down and deals with everything that everybody went through. And it's a very familiar path through the year. There are good days and bad ones. There are tiny moments of weird loveliness and, and just endless flat planes of existential horror. And it's also really funny. And she has an amazing cat. And she embodies her depression as a black dog. And she embodies her capacity for self-care as a white dog. And, nice. the, and those are two direct characters that she interacts with. I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well as her other stuff. Because, like I say, her stuff is very, very funny. Um, and very much worth your time. Also, going back to the story for a moment. Uh, I noticed a lot, or We noticed a lot of folks in the chat were talking about James Harriet. Yes, uh, for those of you who don't know, James Harriet is the author of the um, All Creatures Great and Small books. The show was All Creatures Great and Small, I forget what the, what the books were called. He was a po I've never read the books, I've only watched the show. He was a post-World War II vet, I believe, in Yorkshire, and dealt with the weird logistics of a country recovering from the horrifying consequences of a war... And the weird bits of Yorkshire, which are literally two guys called Fred up a hill with a cow, go, cow's broken. Fix it, veterinary. And it's it's very, very funny and very weird. And, and also deeply sad at times. But if you're getting James Herriot vibes from Sings to Trees, then you're absolutely getting what the book is, is trying to communicate. Um, also, uh, I'm absolutely... Because, you know, sometimes I just have to amuse myself. Sings to Trees accent is very much Henry Cavill. Uh, not Henry Cavill as Geralt or Henry Cavill as Agent Evil Mustache or Superman or anything else, but Henry Cavill, that kind of very clipped, slightly forward, perhaps oh, a little annoyed. Oh, be honest, it's, it's Henry Cavill as Holmes from Enola Holmes. Isn't yes, it, it is. <sighs> Which, if you haven't seen, is wonderful. And beefcakey. It's very nice on the eyes. I'm just gonna say, he barely fits into that waistcoat, and it. Uh, I I just I could... and he has the full on Christopher Reeves bit curl forelock thing. It's so adorable. There's at least one costume I'm fairly certain he was sewn into. Uh, it it is so tight. It's also I mean the whole thing is great, but there is just there's, there's this moment. Where he's walking and walking down the corridor, and he figures something out, and he figures out that Enola has figured it out before him. And Cavill is never going to be one of those actors who gets kudos for emotional subtlety, and it's a real shame because the stuff that he does is much cleverer than a lot of people give him credit for. And you have this like little this kind of two seconds of my baby sister figured that out before me. Should I be annoyed? No, no, I shouldn't. And it's one of the only times you ever see Holmes laugh. And he lets out this just glorious little kind of ha! And walks off. And you can see him going, my sister can play with me. 
This is amazing. Also, he's hot as balls. But... Good Lord, is he ever. Yes, exactly. Um, Marguerite has her priorities, shall we say. Shall we do some shenanigans? Shenanigans. Let's do some shenanigans. This is from the, the wonderfully named Anonymous Typewriter. Q. Well, now that my entire brain... Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a content warning for this, remember? Oh, I'm sorry. Content warning. Horror themes. Violence. Swearing. This, the violence is implied kidnapping. Um, and the full content warning is in the notes, of course. It's foundering time. If, if, if we... If we ever had... <gasps> well, I, I want to talk to Shitpost about maybe making us a new thing that we can have like an animation that takes us into shenanigans. And it's fandering time might might be a very good suggestion. I will take a note, Compost. You, Thank you, know, you very you much. You know in his last couple of years before he successfully dug his escape tunnel and fled, CM Punk would come out, kneel at the top of the ramp, brush something off, check his watch and yell, it's clobbering time. Until Marvel said, excuse me, please knock it off. Is it Philip? Sorry. Yes, exactly. Oh, but we, we decided <coughs> that the Wolverines biting at the back of Sing Satri's knees were Wolverine, and they were the best at what they did. Arr, arr. My name's Patch, and I'm hiding. Anyway, anyway. Oh, something, just before we dive into this, something else weird and lovely that will amuse you. There is a Snapchat TV show, which is seven minutes an episode. Uh, and it's called Ryan Doesn't Know. And it's Ryan Reynolds learning things about uh, fields he has absolutely no knowledge in. Like nail art. And close-up magic. And axe throwing. The axe throwing one does involve photos of Hugh Jackman. We watched the one on close-up magic last night. It was hilarious. So yes, God's perfect idiot <sighs> apparently now has a Snapchat show because that's a thing. Yes. I shouldn't say that. I mean, you're a TikTok star, so hey. Like small less. Small less. Small you're still, less. But you're still very shiny. Thank you. All right. Can we do shenanigans now? Let's do shenanigans. Well, now that my entire brain isn't just a loading screen of Peter Lucas continually moonwalking into the lonely, I am now super excited about the implications of Peter Lucas stamping Martin's frequent kidnapping card. How does that play out exactly? I know Peter isn't chatty, so I imagine the first couple of times he isn't going to answer any questions Martin might decide to ask. But what about when Peter gets back into Elias by taking Martin to a mall and funeral instead of him? Does Peter reveal anything about the powers or what might be going on with the assistants and Elias in greater detail than Martin has had access to? Does Peter offer any advice on dealing with the affections of eye avatars? Does he tell Martin to stay away from his husband? I don't know, I'm fascinated by that dynamic in this context. Help. So, normally I'm a big fan of Peter Lucas tormenting Martin. Probably as much as Peter himself is a fan of Peter tormenting Martin. <laughs> Winky face. But since the goal of kidnapping Martin is to annoy Elias, he has to behave. So Martin's time with Peter goes really well, actually. For Martin, at least. Martin does suspect he's going to get murdered any second, and he is exasperated at Peter not answering any of his questions. But Peter drives him to a grey, lonely-touched hotel, and is like, All right, I'll pick you up in, eight, in like eight hours. Bye! And so Martin, for the first time, gets to sit alone and be reassured he isn't watched. Martin proceeds to take a long bath and sleep for the rest of the eight hours. Peter sits outside and grins as his phone explodes with missed calls and angry texts from Elias, who has been given a massive migraine from the eye, throwing a temper tantrum at precious Martin being gone. Elias knows Peter is ignoring him on purpose and decides to divorce him. He then realises they aren't married, so he resolves to propose the next time they meet, specifically so he can despite divorce him over this. Meanwhile, the Archives crew collectively lose their fucking minds. Sasha paces wildly and throws together a red string board trying to figure out his location, based on all of his last moves. <coughs> Tim is pulling double-time emotional labour to get the others to keep it together. In between putting his face in his hands and trying really very hard not to cry, 
Tim, my perfect boy. If Melanie is there at this point, she's raging and kicking things and going, fine, he can leave then. I don't care. I don't. I refuse. John is probably the biggest mess out of them all. The eldritch migraine he's having is the worst. He flips from doing what Sasha is to lashing out at everyone else for not helping more, which gets Tim to switch from nice to snarling right back, to blaming himself, to just laying on the floor and sobbing. And then, after all of this hullabaloo, Martin wakes up to Peter telling him he'll take him back to the Institute now if Martin so chooses. Martin cringes at the thought, but decides he has to. They ride in silence until they are right in front of the Institute and Martin has just stepped out, at which point Peter says, <coughs> Oh, word of advice. Considering that the Ceaseless Watcher has taken quite a fancy to you, you'd best start to look around for things that block it out. It's tiring enough with just one of them after you. The Ceaseless what? Peter then proceeds to drive off, assholishly, and Martin gets mobbed by frantically affectionate Ivatars. Ash, ash, assholeishly. I love that word. I, my part of my personal head canon is that because Peter and Simon have hung out an awful lot, Peter keeps tr trying on bye, and he just he can't quite make it work. Because while stop si trying to make bye <laughs> happen. Because while Simon can just zoom away, Peter's like bye. And Peter, it's fog. I'm leaving. Bye, Peter. Bye. Peter. Bye. Water drive. Were there some hashtags in there as well, I think? I believe there are. Hashtags, oh god, yes. Hashtag, yes, yes, yes. Hashtag, Peter Lucas drops one hint and leaves. Hashtag, that's so him. Hashtag, such an asshole. Yes. Uh, tonight's gender, a long bath and eight hours sleep. Oh. I, I just really like the idea of Peter being a faintly inept kidnapper who's just like, here, go and stay in this kind of nice hotel and get some rest. What? I yeah. gave the desk my credit card so you could use the mini bar. Don't eat the M&Ms. Why? Because I want to. Exactly. So I'm, that's a show. It's so true, Zalia. Eight hours sleep sounds fake. I, I just, I, I've heard tell of it in legend. Yeah, exactly. Martin's like, I should get kicked off Rob. Yeah, really. If that's kidnapping. I'd recommend time, it, yeah. honestly. Exactly. Why don't you tell all our lovely folks where they can find you next? Well, the next time you'll be able to hear my dulcet tones is this Friday on Pseudopod when uh, another another horror story drops all the way into your ears and whispers terrible truths all the way down. And I will be hosting that as ever I do. Then we will be, we will be back on Sunday between 10 and 12 p.m. Um, British summertime. When Marguerite will be continuing. Oh, uh, the council has gone so very, very strange. The I, I, political <sighs> intrigue, murder investigating... Left demon term busting. off the deep end into demon possession, whatever happened to the council. Yes, exactly. Um, <coughs> <coughs> also on Friday, the full lid will be released at 5 p.m., um, which is our Hugo nominated uh, hour. hour. Yes, okay, hour. Hugo nominated pop culture newsletter. Um, and that has all kinds of really fun stuff in it this week, including a deeply, deeply lovely uh, graphic novel by Tom Cold called Moon Cop, which is one of my favourite things I've read so far this year. Um, There's a lot of favourite things he's read this year. Mm, it's he very true. And then we'll be, we'll be back here next week for the second part of Nine Goblins. That is correct. Right. Thank you so much as ever, folks. You, you all are amazing. Um, and if you need us, there will be stream show notes coming up shortly. And we will be on the Twitters between now and the rest of the week. We're always on the Twitters. Always on the Twitters, so never bad. knowingly We're off so Twitter. Bad always being on the Twitters. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night.
Thank you.